Excellent. Well, look, thank you so much, um, Gula, for for the invite to to speak. It's always we were just chatting before you all joined us to say how it's you know in many areas of healthcare and in medicine these kind of international um, collaborations are are common, but they they seem less common in EMS, although that is gradually changing, I think, for the better, because we all have so much to learn from each other. Um, so my, my name's David. I'm an intensive care physician from Melbourne, Australia. My main role was as the medical director of Ambulance Victoria, and I'll tell you a little bit about Ambulance Victoria shortly. Um, and I'm going to have a chat with you for the next half hour or so about some of the background to and some of the controversies that exist in airway management in the pre-hospital setting and a little bit about how it works in our setting in Australia and New Zealand which is perhaps quite different to how it is in many other parts of the world particularly in Europe so hopefully some 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 stimulating conversation and maybe a little bit of controversy as well um hmm. so in Australia it's customary for us to acknowledge um the um, traditional custodians, the Aboriginal people um, of our land. And even though I'm not in Australia at the moment, I just wanted to recognise and acknowledge that I prepared this talk and that I live, work and play on um, on Aboriginal land. Um, and um, in, a, in a country like ours that has a, a six, 60,000 years of Indigenous history and culture, I think it's important for us to, to recognise and acknowledge that. <laughs> Before I go on to talk about the, the meat of airway management, just a little bit about Ambulance Victoria. Um, so we are the jurisdictional ambulance service for the state of Victoria uh, in, in southeastern Australia. Uh, Victoria is the second smallest state in Australia, but as you can see, I've, I've tried to get the sizes right there. We're more than twice the size of Hungary um, with a population of about six and a half million. Um, as an ambulance service, we cover the whole state um, road and air. Um, we answer about a million um, emergency calls a year. And we have about 5,000 paramedics and 500 um, specialist critical care paramedics. Um, and from an airway management point of view, we perform about 2,500 field intubations per year, or, or critical care paramedics do that. So a bit of, a bit of context as to, as to where we've come from. So I want to ask a few questions and see if we can answer a few questions over the next little while. The first um, is, should we be intubating pre-hospital? You know, how should, what should airway management look like in the pre-hospital setting? If we should be intubating, then which patients should we be intubating? And who should be doing it? It's perhaps the most controversial question. And how should they be doing it? And then I'll finish off by touching on what those with a more in-hospital focus can learn from how we practice airway management in the pre-hospital setting. The first question is both the easiest and the hardest to answer. Um, and, you know, there's some reasons why to give you some context. Now, I, I presume many of you on the webinar, perhaps all of you are familiar with the pre-hospital setting, but just for those of you who, who may not be, to give you some context, there's a big difference between performing advanced clinical procedures such as airway management in the warm, well-lit, calm environment of a hospital resuscitation bay um, uh, versus the crowded, cluttered, damp carpet, what's that smell of, of, the, of someone's living room. Um, and, you know, there's often a requirement to do significant rearrangement of, of furniture. And also, you know, we could be in a ditch, um, you know, beside an upside down car or outside in the rain, in the dark. So that's a very challenging environment. Um, instead of having a trolley or multiple trolleys full of equipment, we have a bag and the bag contains as much as a bag can carry. And in Australia, um, particularly in Victoria, we have very, very strict health and safety legislation around how heavy these bags can be. So we're actually quite strictly limited on what we can carry. Now, I will argue later in the talk that that's actually a benefit because too much equipment, um, you know, I th I'm sure we've all worked in a department where you go to get the difficult airway trolley and open the drawer and a hundred things fall out because that's Dr. Smith's favorite one. And this is Dr. Jones' favorite piece of equipment. Um, so perhaps less is more. 
Um, a bit of history. Um, I tried to, the first time I gave a version of this talk, I, I thought about when the first pre-hospital intubation was and how long we've been practicing airway management in the pre-hospital environment. I, I think realistically, probably the first pre-hospital intubation was probably during um, uh, World War II um, in a military setting. But the first paramedic civilian pre-hospital intubation was almost certainly in um, in Baltimore in 1967. Um, with the Freedom House Ambulance, which is a, a very historic um, ambulance service in the in the US, uh, followed not long after, I'm proud to say, by Melbourne, where our mobile intensive care ambulance or MICA program was set up in 1971. Um, and so we've had we've had specialist intensive care paramedics in in Melbourne and in Victoria for for over 50 years. Although I'm very glad to say we no longer wear silly hats or have giant sideburns. Um, so a bit of context leading into the first question, should we be intubating pre-hospital? And as I said, it's both easy and difficult to answer because the answer is, I don't really know. Um, and when you don't know the answer to a question, perhaps the best thing to do is, first of all, to look at the evidence. And if there is no evidence, then to look at what's in the best interest or what we think is in the best interest of the patient and what seems to be biologically plausible. So I want to answer this question by looking at the most common indications for intubation in the pre-hospital environment to see what the practice is and how the evidence stacks up. In our setting, the two most common reasons for someone to be intubated in the pre-hospital setting is cardiac arrest and severe traumatic brain injury. And so I thought it was a good idea to have a look at what evidence there is around airway management practice in the pre-hospital setting in these two clinical presentations. For cardiac arrest, um, there were actually three quite large studies published in the same year, um, all looking at pre-hospital airway management. The first um, was perhaps more applicable to your setting, although I'm not sure, and I'll be keen to hear how different. This was a study that was done in the Netherlands, and I think also perhaps in, in Belgium, uh, or maybe the other way around, randomizing 2,000 odd patients to either bag valve mask ventilation or intubation in the setting of cardiac arrest. And their primary outcome was a good one. It was favorable neurological outcome at 28 days. And they showed no difference in survival, which is interesting. Um, just a little, for those of you who are not used to looking at adult cardiac arrest data, a little, a little trick. Um, when you see survival numbers below 10%, so most, most ambulance services will quote survival for all comers in cardiac arrest of somewhere in the region of 8 to 12%. When you see numbers lower than that, it usually means that that's a setting where ambulance clinicians are not able to withhold resuscitation for unwitnessed asystolic cardiac arrests. So most high-functioning ambulance services won't commence resuscitation on someone who's had an unwitnessed asystolic arrest because many, many large registries show that the survival in that population is zero. When you see numbers of 2 3 4% survival, that probably means that that's a service that attempts resuscitation on asystolic patients. Um, the next trial in the United States, um, 3,000 patients, they were randomized to combi tube versus intubation. Um, I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with the combi tube. I've I've never used one clinically. I've used it on a mannequin. Um, the best description I've ever heard of it is a very complicated way to kill someone. Um, basically, a, a a giant tube with a series of balloons. Sometimes it will go into. Most of the time, it will go into the esophagus. Occasionally, it will go into the trachea. Um, they seem to have really only gained popularity in North America. I'm not sure how popular, if at all, they were in Europe. They certainly never took off in Australia. They had a quite an odd outcome measure of 72-hour survival and found, um, again, no statistically significant difference in survival. The study that's most relevant, certainly to our practice in Australasia, and I presume to practice across most of Europe, was performed in the UK, a large multi-centre study of over 9,000 patients randomizing um, cardiac arrest patients to IGEL supraglottic airway versus endotracheal intubation with, again, a, a good outcome measure of neurological outcome at 30 days, and again, showing no difference. So this was quite a startling result for, for many clinicians, particularly for, for many paramedics who viewed intubation as, as one of the cornerstones of their practice. 
And I guess it led to a bit of controversy and many paramedics on, on social media and in other settings saying, well, you know, that evidence doesn't apply to me. How dare you take intubation away from me? But what ended up happening as a result in many settings, particularly in the UK, was that intubation was removed from the scope of practice for most paramedics, if not all paramedics. I don't think that's where it ends, though, um, because what's happened in the last 10 years has been a new treatment has arisen for um, CPR in most settings, and that's um, eCPR or ECMO CPR. And so this is a different cohort or a specific cohort of patients. And it seems increasingly likely that in this cohort of patients with refractory cardiac arrest, there may actually be a role for intubation. And so this is a, a retrospective cohort study of 420 consecutive patients with refractory cardiac arrest presenting to a single center in Minneapolis in the US. And um, just observational data looking at um, physiological data and also looking at survival in patients who were intubated versus patients who weren't. So remember, this isn't um, randomized data. This is just observational data. But what they found is that in the patients who arrived intubated versus those who didn't, um, they had a higher PaO2, a lower PaCO2, and a higher pH, and that meant that more of them were eligible for ECMO support, which resulted in a higher neurologically intact survival in the patients with refractory cardiac arrest um, who were intubated. Now, remember, this is a small group of patients. This is the, the young, potentially salvageable patients who are ECMO candidates, but some interesting data. And what that means for me as a medical director is I discourage regular, or we don't let our regular paramedics intubate, but they can all use eye gels. But the practice for most of our paramedics in cardiac arrest settings is put in an eye gel. And um, if it's a young person with refractory arrest and um, you're transporting for ECMO or we're sending an ECMO team to the scene, then you intubate. Or you get if you get ROSC, then you do an RSI after ROSC. And that, that's our practice pretty much routinely. What about traumatic brain injury? Well, we know that the big killers in traumatic brain injury are secondary brain injury, which is caused by hypoxia, hypercarbia, and hypotension. And um, so the question becomes, what benefit or effect does um, airway management have on those three things? But also, how does airway management in the pre-hospital setting affect the time to definitive management in the, in the relatively small cohort of TBI patients who have a expanding space-occupying lesion? And again, a bit of data to support us here, but nowhere near as good as the data we have for cardiac arrest. So three main trials that people speak about. The first one, the Davis trial from 2003, 800-odd um, uh, patients. Now, this was a historical case control study. So about 200 patients underwent pre All right, so sorry about the technical problem. David's Wi-Fi just disconnected, so he's he's desperately trying to join again. But uh, we uh, agreed that I should uh, start with my second part, which uh, which I uh, prepared about pediatric area management, and then uh, by the time <clears throat> I finish, uh, he's going to be able to restart from where he where we were lost. Okay, so sorry about that. And we are sorting it out now. Okay, so uh, my second part is about pre-hospital pediatric airway management since I'm uh, medical director of St. Martin's uh, Pediatric Medical Emergency, uh, Emergency Service. Uh, and we care for sick babies and children in Hungary. Uh, but uh, this is not going to be a comprehensive talk on, on pediatric airway because obviously that's a, a, such a big topic. Um, but uh, I just prepared really some highlights which I find interesting and uh, and really uh, important to, to mention. So first of all, we are an ambulance service caring for sick babies and children. We try to be as children and parent friendly as possible, uh, which I hope hopefully you can see from our pictures. Uh, these are the four units we uh, we operate with and. Uh, uh, this also means that uh, a part of Hungary is, uh, so to say, uh, covered with pedi specialized pediatric emergency uh, services. But uh, at the same time, 
uh, uh, and knowing that also other uh, services uh, cover uh, another part of Hungary. But at the same time, we know that there are some blind spots and uh, especially during night time, um, actually we can say that most of the critically ill children who are uh, cared for pre-hospitally are cared by paramedics and uh, and so to say normal route ambulance uh, systems. So therefore, I think it's, this topic is this talk is very important for them as well because not all the children uh, have have the uh, so to say luxury to be transported by a specialized ambulance service team uh, with really specialized equipment, but lots of them. Uh, have to rely on their local uh, ambulance teams, which who are actually very well equipped and very well trained as well. But uh, this talk is just the aim is to to support some additional information on pediatric airways. So, uh, what uh, cases we care for? Uh, actually, there's there's no not much difference from uh, from what people see in a, a pediatric a &E department. So uh, primary, as primary pre-hospital causes, we, we have lots of kids with uh, respiratory neuro um, related uh, cases like uh, convulsions, status epilepticus or uh, neuro infections. Uh, and also we can go to lots of kids with minor or major injuries like burns, scalds, and some uh, other extremity fractures, fractures and other injuries as well. Uh, a quite big amount of our job, approximately 20% uh, is related to secondary transport, which means that uh, uh, there are lots of babies and children who have to be transported, for example, uh, from a, a smaller hospital to a, a bigger center, uh, for example, in the capital city. But uh, these transports are not always only transports because we uh, there are lots of cases where we have to stabilize uh, babies and children on scene because these uh, facilities don't have an, their own PICU background and therefore um, we have to help them on scene and together with the sending hospital we have to stabilize these patients before starting to transfer them transfer them. So these are the four topics uh, which uh, I already said are not exhaustive list of what we have to know about the airway, but uh, really some just the highlights about uh, what I uh, experienced in the, in the last few years. So first I would like to talk about the airway, pediatric airway physiology, then uh, especially some important points on dead space and, uh, and airway uh, uh, dead space. Um, then uh, quite specific uh, conditions related to a high risk of peri-intubation cardiac arrest or peri-intubation uh, complications. And at, at last, I'm going to touch on what we do uh, as education. So let's start with the, the pediatric RSI physiology, so to say. Uh, and I think the most important point is hypoxia because lots of kids and babies uh, present with an illness uh, linked with hypoxia and, and uh, most frequently the, the indication itself for, our, for an RSI is hypoxia. It's also important difference from adults that, uh, uh, hypo that bradycardic patients uh, among children are usually not something to do with uh, um, uh, cardiology uh, uh, related illness or something to do with real arrhythmias, but actually bradycardia is hypoxia until proven, proven otherwise. Uh, a second uh, important point that the risk of hypoxia during an RSI part, uh, clearly outweighs the risk of aspiration. So uh, that's a very uh, important distinction from the adult uh, physiology. But therefore we actually uh, started and continued to use a so-called modified RSI, uh, which I'm going to talk about later, but uh, is some is actually based on a careful um, bag mask ventilation 
after uh, administ administering uh, neuromuscular blocking drugs. Um, okay, so what's next? The, the dose and size calculations are uh, can be somewhat uh, frightening for those people who who, uh, who who don't deal on a daily basis with with children. Um, but I have to say there's there is help out there. So partly uh, you have I would encourage everyone to use uh, applications like this one from Denmark. Uh, it's a very very nice one. I would encourage everyone uh, uh, to use this. Uh, uh, and uh, actually, uh, either this application or any other application which are used for pediatric uh, data and pediatric airways is to do with uh, changing the, the age group, changing the weights, and then getting instant results about the tube length, tube sizes, uh, different drug doses, and the most important things which we have to do when resuscitating critically ill children. Uh, this this application, for example, is a few euros uh, cost, but there are lots of them out there which are freely available as well. Uh, and I'm sure uh, David also is going to mention their application because that's a nice one as well from Victoria. This is a second opinion, second uh, opportunity. So what we recently did in our service, and I'm going to tell you about that later on, is uh, is a standardized uh, RSI preparation. And a part of as a part of that, we also have a, a printed uh, sheet which contains all the typical age groups from the premature baby to a young adult, and you don't have to calculate it in a in a critical uh, situation, but you have that down there, and you just have to read it out loud. All right, so let's switch to to what we have to do. Uh, to prevent hypoxia. I think uh, high quality bag mass ventilation is really the, the, uh, the starting point and the most important point which you have to learn as a pediatric provider because it, it actually people think, uh, lots of the times people think it's an obvious thing to do and everyone can do a, a BMV, so bag mass ventilation. But what we see in, in normal, in real life, and in the everyday work is that uh, these babies and small children are so much relying on uh, on an effective chest rise and an effective mask seal that you really have to improve your skill set to do it also in a critical condition. And what we what we encourage our uh, colleagues to do is this so-called two-handed uh, grip, two-handed CE grip, because as you see in this picture, the most effective way to open the airway and at the same time do a head tilt, chin lift and open the mouth is with, with a bimanual bi thing. And uh, actually it's uh, not so important who is pressing the balloon or, or, uh, or if you use a, uh, a transport ventilator, you can also connect it to the ventilator and you can set, a, set some pressures. But the, the main, most important thing is really your two hands which uh, maintain this, uh, this uh, mask seal. All right, so what I was, uh, touching on earlier is the difference between the so-called original RSI, uh, the, the adult type RSI, which where the priority is the aspiration protection. So classically, we pre-oxygenate adults, then we induce them with uh, an elastic and then relaxant, then wait, uh, and with passive uh, ap apnea time and oxygenation, uh, there's usually enough um, oxygen reserves to wait with a very good saturation until uh, the provider starts laryngoscopy and intubates the patient and later on ventilates uh, them as well. The below the flow chart, the so-called modified RSI, or as if you like, you can also call it a DSI, so delayed sequence intubation, means that you, if you are able, obviously, it's not always trivial in babies, you can pre-oxygenate. Uh, most of the time, actually, they don't really cooperate with it or uh, they are already ventilated with the bag, bag and mass. Then uh, at time zero, you induce them with an anesthetic and the neuromuscular blocking agent, and then start a, a so-called controlled bag mass ventilation, which means uh, you really uh, aim to, to, to ventilate with a low pressure 
uh, something below uh, 15 because pressure above 15 centimeters of water would uh, be actually a high risk of opening the is a lower esophageal sphincter and leading to uh, regurgitation or respiration. Then if you do this controlled uh, bag mass ventilation, you have the time to make sure there's adequate hemodynamics, there's adequate depth of anesthesia and neuromuscular blocking, blocking drugs. And then after typically one and a half to two minutes, you can go on with ventilation, uh, with laryngoscopy, intubation and ventilation. So that's the main difference between the two. I also brought you uh, an interesting article. Actually, it's from last year from the ESAIC and BGA. It was a cooperation. Um, and this guideline is, is a really important description how you should intubate neonates and infants. Actually, it's not something which is specifically pre-hospital, but I'm sure there are lots of uh, facts in that which we as pre-hospital providers can also really uh, profit from. And I just really emphasize the three main points which I found really interesting for us uh, in Hungary. You, in neonates and small children's difficult airway exists as well, and you have to prepare and you, and the preparation is really something about human factors much more than equipment and drugs. Um, something which is really sounds really trivial, but unfortunately in Hungary, uh, in the and especially in the hospital settings in P NICUs and PICUs, it's not hundred uh, percent uh, standard uh, that we verify the uh, successful intubation and the tube's position with an ATCO2. Uh, measurements, so waveform capnography. It's a really important point, and uh, this is, I think, something we have to work on in Hungary, and actually we are, we are working in, on, in, uh, on it, and uh, uh, it's uh, in the past 10 to 15 years in the ambulance sector, sector I think there was a great uh, uh, improvement in this topic, and nowadays I can say that in the ambulance sector, so in the pre-hospital pre uh, teams, uh, a capnography is capnography is really a must and really a standard equipment uh, by when intubating patients. And something which is also controversial because we wanted to be make this webinar something which we can discuss things is that uh, this article really clearly states that video laryngoscopy should be the first choice in neonates and infants. And that brings us the question: If you have, if you want to intubate with a direct or a video laryngoscope, and as I said, the the guideline now says that video VL should be the first choice. But as a side note, I just wanted to mention that uh, uh, I think it, it's really a nice thing, and we also started to use it uh, a few years ago. But uh, I'm sure that I should, I wouldn't encourage anyone to use a video laryngoscope who didn't have uh, or hadn't had uh, proper training, uh, for example, in an operating theater or in a, or uh, on mannequins with video laryngoscopy. So I wouldn't encourage anyone to start using video laryngoscopy in a critically ill child. So uh, I think that's a very important uh, side note. Uh, and at the same time, uh, maybe that's the future. So we have, we all have to prepare for it and we all have to train it when we have the opportunity. All right, so just to, to go on uh, uh, with the case. Uh, uh, in Hungary, there was a few years ago, there was a five-year-old boy who submerged into a chemical field well. He was, after an on-scene stabilization and resuscitation, he was transferred to a local PICU developed ARDS within 24 hours, required really high ventilatory pressures and requirements, and uh, was very rightly referred on VV ECMO, and was transported with, uh, by a local team, by a paramedic-led team. And this paramedic was excellent, did an excellent job uh, because he, he realized that this continuously sedated and ventilated uh, child who was on, also on continuous relaxant uh, developed tachycardia and uh, continually increasing sedation requirements and also a progressive rise in ETCO2 uh, while maintaining quite good, quite acceptable oxygenation at the same time. And he started to do, to do telephone calls and uh, consulted several people. 
And all these clinicians uh, gave some advice about what he should dial on the ventilator. So what tidal volume, what uh, frequency, what inspiratory time and so on should be uh, dialed. Uh, but this process went on. And as you can see on this uh, life pack device, uh, the ETCO2 value is something above 99 because that's the limit the, the monitor can um, um, can uh, um, uh, measure e CO2 values up to. And uh, by the time ar they arrived in the ECMO center, the first arterial blood gas was also extremely uh, hypercopnic uh, and uh, there was a, an extreme respiratory acidosis. And uh, that I would like to, to give so, a very short poll because that's an exciting uh, that's an exciting question. So I would like you to to please vote on this. This is the same QR code and the same Slido uh, homepage. So if you just uh, uh, just go on your browser again, you I'm sure you are going to find this uh, this question. And I'm not going to show you the results until all of uh, most of the people have uh, voted on some of them. Uh, so what is the most likely cause of hypercopnia? Is it an in inappropriately set tidal volume? Is it an inappropriately set respiratory rate? Is it an excessive instrumental death space? Or is it just that this patient has ARDS and the pulmonary pathology itself uh, um, meant that the, the patient developed uh, this extreme hypercopnia. We wait a few more seconds until all of uh, those who wanted to vote can vote. All right. So let's see what is the correct answer. The correct answer was the correct answer was the excessive instrumental dead space, but actually. Uh, probably all of you were right about your choices, but what I wanted to emphasize with this small short case is that uh, uh, the smaller the kid, the more uh, emphasis is there for uh, for an airway that space, and that's actually something uh, that's not only a Hungarian specific thing, but uh, a few years ago there was an uh, a medical de device alert coming from the UK which discussed actually the same problem. Uh, so what, what ha probably happened in this case is that the patient obviously had a pulmonary pathology, that's for sure. But what they did was they were really fixated on what to dial on the ventilator. And they didn't really mention, didn't really, really realize that this was an adult uh, airway circuit. And also didn't realize that this was an adult HME filter. So what they, uh, Miss is probably was that uh, the the so-called instrumental death space was almost as high as the patient's tidal volume because that this kid was uh, uh, for about fourteen kilograms um, weight so their tidal volume was around hundred milliliters was below hundred milliliters and it's quite quite deceptive because on the Draeger uh, device you can set uh, tidal volume as low as fifty. But that only means that you should always choose the right equipment and the right circuit. And if you don't have a pediatric circuit or a pediatric HME filter, actually that's not so not such a tragedy. But you have to change to uh, the the intubated patient being ventilated for this period with a bag, and this completely uh, resolves this issue or or makes it uh, really really better at that time. All right, so. The smaller the patient, the more uh, the dead space matters, and that was just something I want would I wanted to emphasize. All right, um, very intubation cardiac arrest. It's really a vast topic, so I'm not going to into detail because of time limits. But just wanted really wanted to mention these four important conditions because. Uh, uh, for example, shock babies and shock children, no matter what the cause of the shock is, they are really at high risk. And this, there's this saying, resuscitate before you intubate, is really true for this patient category because uh, you don't want to push the patient with your 
anesthetics and your positive pressure ventilation into your cardiac arrest. The second uh, condition is status asthmaticus or any other condition which is which uh, means a, a lower a small airway obstruction, so an obstructive lung disease. Because this is this not only can go uh, can result in hypoxia in a, uh, through a dynamic hyperinflation. But uh, in case the, the ventilator in this intubated, already intubated patient is not set properly, there's not enough time for exhalation. There are two high pressures and not enough time to exhale. There can be such dynamic hyperinflation that, all, that this can also affect the hemodynamics and this can also lead to a cardiac arrest. The third, third one is severe metabolic acidosis. Like the most typical cause is a DKA, so diabetic ketoacidosis. This is quite common also in kids. And if you, for some reason, you have to intubate this kid, for example, because they have a very bad level of consciousness with a GCS of three, or they suddenly develop an acute abdomen and there's a surgery going on, uh, you really have to pay attention with, to maintain this extreme hyperventilation, which was there before intubation, because of, uh, in the aim of compensating this extreme high metabolic acid load. And if you suddenly take away, the, away this high minute ventilation, because you push the paralytics, you push the anesthetics, and you intubate the patient, uh, and you, for example, halve this minute ventilation, you can really suddenly push this patient into a cardiac arrest because then the pH drops so suddenly that the heart really cannot handle with this pH drop. So that's something I would like uh, to all of you to remember. Uh, the fourth condition is, is a very specific one and I'm sure lots of you haven't even heard about it, but this is something which uh, we in pediatric hemato-oncology uh, encounter quite frequently. So an anterior mediastina, mediastina mass, mediastinal mass, for example, a mediastinal lymphoma is something that, uh, for example, uh, a lymphoma patient can develop quite slowly and can reach a condition where they can still spontaneously ventilate and self-position themselves with a, with a quite normal breathing. But by the time you, for some reason, intubate them, and take away their positive, my negative pressure breathing, and switch to a completely different uh, physiologic uh, situation with intubation and positive pressure ventilation. This can also lead to a cardiac arrest or uh, a narrowing of the airway with extremely high pressures, uh, vena cava superior syndrome, and so on. So this is something you really have to prepare for, really have to discuss with several people before deciding to intubate. As I said, we don't really have much time for these topics to expound, but if someone's interested, I can really uh, just uh, uh, recommend these two webinars where we discuss all these topics in detail. All right, so our last topic, and then I, I give some more time to David to finish, uh, is education. We try to educate as much people as possible from pediatric first aid and BLS for the lay people in the public, but we also emphasis put the emphasis on the healthcare workers, particularly paramedics. We hold pediatric emergency course. We also do regularly every year a point of care ultrasound course, uh, specifically in pediatric emergencies. And our last course is what we developed in, is an airway simulation training, which we actually just started in our team as a as a the simulation training for our uh, colleagues in Budapest. We developed the so-called RSI kit dump, which I'm sure David is going, also going to mention. And then it's something actually to do with pre standardized pre uh, RSI preparation. Because if you think about this using this paper, you are, I'm sure you are not going to miss anything because every, everything has this own place. There's also a checklist included with also a drug table included. So you, it's a really safe thing to use. And what we did uh, recently was start some uh, dummy uh, uh, preparation in our own ambulance among our own uh, uh, small animals. And, uh, and it it's, seems to be really successful. There were also already cases when we used it in, in, a, in a normal situation. And I hope that uh, not only my colleagues, 
in Budapest, but also everyone in Hungary uh, will be able to join. And this uh, course is, is going to be quite successful, I think. With that, I'm, I would like to thank you for your attention. Uh, if someone is interested, they can send me an email. But uh, now I think we should uh, go over to David's slides where we lost it, lost connections. And then uh, obviously you are going to have time for questions. Thanks, Guler, and uh, my apologies, everyone. Uh, nothing gets the blood pumping more than losing your internet connection during a talk. Um, let me go back to where we were. Um, so can you see my slide there? Yes, I can. we can see it. And I've probably got another 15 minutes or so to go oh, and hopefully fine. some time for questions. So I've, oh, I, right. your time is no valuable, but hopefully some of you will be able to stay on a bit longer. Absolutely. So where we were up to was saying there was one, um, not a great methodological trial, a historical case control before and after trial in the early 2000s of, of RSI for traumatic brain injury in the pre-hospital environment that showed uh, um, an increase in mortality. What's notable about this trial is that the paramedics in the trial were, um, had, were experienced at intubating in cardiac arrest, but um, they were taught how to do RSI in, a, I believe, a half a day course. Um, so perhaps, and, and all of the paramedics in the jurisdiction were taught to do it rather than any specialization. The next trial was one that was actually done in my service before my time in, in Melbourne. Um, this was a randomized controlled trial, 300 specialist intensive care paramedics who were given extensive training in rapid sequence intubation, including theater time. Um, the outcome was favorable neurological outcome um, characterized by a dichotomized Glasgow outcome score at six months. And this showed a very significant increase in favorable neurological outcome. More recently, a pre-specified secondary analysis of a larger trial of 800 patients, um, which was originally looking at um, the effect of progesterone on traumatic brain injury, um, also looked at um, outcomes in patients who were intubated versus those who weren't for out-of-hospital traumatic brain injury, and again showed a significant increase in survival. Important caveat here that, that this wasn't randomizing to intubation versus no intubation. This was a subgroup analysis, although pre-specified of another trial. So where does that leave us? Well, there was a meta-analysis done a couple of years ago looking at all of the randomized and observational trials. When you look at all of the data, it's pretty unclear. There's no, there's no signal either way. Um, I think the, um, the, the, the meta-analysis looking at just the RCTs, um, I think they, they didn't include the Davis trial, which fair enough, it wasn't randomized. Um, although you could argue that the Denninghoff trial, the subgroup analysis probably wasn't the best either. Um, but you could argue that there's a signal towards benefit there for, for um, pre-hospital intubation in RSI. Why was, there, why was there an increase in mortality in that first trial, the San Diego trial, the Davis trial? Well, some of the data shows from, from the recordings of the um, intubations from the monitors, there were very, very prolonged attempts at intubation in many patients, significant hypoxia, bradycardia, hypotension, um, which, as you can imagine, you know, we, we, the, the, the reason we think intubation might be beneficial in TBI is to prevent hypoxia, hypotension, and hypercarbia. So we don't want to be causing hypoxia, hypotension, and hypercarbia, which is what was probably happening in these settings. And it's a good reminder for us. This is in-hospital data, but I think it's very relevant um, of the complications that are associated with intubating critically ill patients. Gil has already touched on some of them already in the pediatric setting. This was a, a prospective observational trial of patients being intubated in the ICU setting. So a slightly different patient cohort to pre-hospital. Most of, most of the patients in ICU are intubated for respiratory failure um, and then a bunch of neurological and others. But what it showed, and this, this matches the practice of any of you who practice in an ICU, whenever you intubate a critically ill patient, just under half of them will get hypotension and you'll need to use a vasopressor. About 10% of them will get hypoxic and about 3%, this is adults, will have a cardiac arrest and half of them will die. So this is a pretty risky thing that we're doing. So we really want to be able to show a benefit. Um, so there is ongoing work in the space of um, pre-hospital intubation for RSI. And this is an interesting um, recent little retrospective analysis of 300 patients um, from, I 
think from Sweden, somewhere, maybe Denmark. Um, and what they did was they correlated end tidal with arterial CO2 and um, showed that controlling arterial CO2 resulted in a survival benefit in, in TBI patients. And you can only really do that if you intubate. And um, this also now we're in the realm of we're not only intubating the person, we're also putting in an art line pre-hospital because the, the correlation between end tidal and arterial CO2 wasn't what we'd like. Um, but they have, um, and I haven't included it, but the same group have also got some data showing that um, the time taken to do those two procedures probably benefits the patient rather than um, rather than disadvantages them. Because there's always been a worry that pre-hospital, anything pre-hospital that adds time could adversely affect the patient. But you know, those of you who practice in a neurocritical care setting will know most patients with a TBI don't have an expanding space occupying lesion. They've got a diffuse traumatic brain injury, the treatment of which is control of CO2, control of oxygen, control of blood pressure. So there's a good plausibility for that to be done. Um, so, you know, where should it be done? Um, um, you know, should it be done at the accident scene? Should it be done on the way to hospital? Should it be done in ED? Should it be done in the operating room? Um, I think you know, my inclination is that it probably should be done before the patient gets to the operating room and probably before they get to radiology. Um, and um, the, so the question then becomes, you know, the the time taken to get the patient to their CT scan. And we, we're looking at doing a trial or at least some observational, collecting some observational data, looking at time taken to get a patient to scan with pre-hospital versus ED intubation, because I think that's the meaningful variable. And then, of course, a big question about um, modality of transport, road versus air. Um, I think it's it's pretty clear cut that if someone's flying 200 kilometers and they're a thrashy traumatic brain injury, they need to be intubated. If someone's a 20 minute drive from hospital in the back of an ambulance, I think that's less clear. And we probably do need a bit more a bit more data there. Other reasons that someone might need to be intubated in the pre-hospital setting some sort of neurological catastrophe, either status epilepticus or a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, some toxicology problems, you know, particularly a tricyclic overdose, where again, control of CO2 or control of pH is important, um, particularly relevant during the, the, you know, the pandemic, obviously um, pneumonia, respiratory failure. A couple that I think are often understated is um, what, what, what we would refer to as humanitarian indications, a major trauma patient with severe pain or particularly a burns patient with, with high total body surface area burns with severe pain. These patients are going to be intubated as soon as they arrive in hospital. So we would advocate in our setting for that to be done in the pre-hospital setting as a humane thing to allow us to provide a decent dose of analgesia and sedation. So just in the last few minutes, perhaps the more controversial aspects of the talk, who should be doing the intubating in the pre-hospital environment? Should it be dashing, handsome doctors and nurses, or should it be uh, paramedics with shorts and long socks in this old photograph from, from New Zealand? Um, and I'm sorry to disappoint you, but the answer is um, it probably doesn't matter. Um, the person doing it should just be an experienced airway management clinician. Because the problem, of course, is um, the intubation, I think, is like driving and like sex. Everyone thinks they're amazing at it, but 50% of people have to be below average, um, as with any practical skill. And so professional background doesn't come into it. It's just experience. And we do have some data to support that. Um, this was uh, this was just from from Twitter X a few years ago, um, looking at whether par you know the the ins how many paramedics are doing RSI. So you know uh, close to fifty percent probably um, of of pre hospital intubations are done by paramedics. The rest done by doctors. Does it make a difference? These are some data from Europe um, that do sh suggest that um, that doctors have a more significant first pass, significantly increased first pass success and overall intubation success rate compared to paramedics or nurses. Um, although data from our setting in Victoria show a, su a success rate, um, a first pass success rate of 89% and an intubation success rate of 99%. So comparable to that seen by doctors in the previous trial. And that carries for children as well first pass success of 93% and intubation success rate of 99% for children in our setting. So I think what this shows is, to me is that it doesn't matter who's putting the plastic between the vocal cords, as long as they're well-trained, working in a well-governed system, well-experienced. How should they be intubating? We've already touched on this. 
Um, there's been a quite a bit of work recently on their direct versus video laryngoscopy. Um, there's been um, uh, looking at adverse events. Um, you know, as some early work, um, uh, meta analysis um, suggesting a benefit to video laryngoscopy. There's been an observational trial in using a North American, a large North American emergency medicine registry again, showing a significant increase in first pass success with relatively inexperienced intubators, and that's a caveat there. There's been a Cochrane review, which clearly shows a benefit, a small benefit to video laryngoscopy in critically ill patients. And more recently, there's been um, a couple of randomized controlled trials, three, um, including one in the pediatric setting, and all of them are showing the same thing, that in critically ill patients, adults or children, video laryngoscopy is safer and faster and is associated with better first pass success than direct laryngoscopy. Um, we haven't gone to the stage yet in our setting of mandating video laryngoscopy, but the language I use with our paramedics is um, that it is recommended by me. It's recommended in the guideline. And I tell them that if they use video laryngoscopy and something goes wrong and the patient dies, it will be me standing in the coroner's court defending our practice. And if they don't use video laryngoscopy and the patient dies, it will be them standing in the coroner's court defending their practice as to why it's different from everyone else. And I think it's probably 99% of our paramedics are using video laryngoscopy as are our doctors now. I actually couldn't tell you the last time I did direct laryngoscopy. It must have been, you know, more than 10 years ago, probably. So just very quickly in the last couple of minutes, what can those of you who only work in hospital learn from us in the pre-hospital environment? Quite a lot, I think. One thing, so emergency care in the pre-hospital environment has a, has a, I guess, a paramilitary history. It arose, paramedicine arose from the military. Um, pre-hospital medicine arose from combat. Um, and we still have this hierarchical, we have uniforms and rank and epaulets and this hierarchical structure. And so that means paramedics, by and large, will do as they're told and follow a guideline. Um, doctors, in my experience, often think they know best and will tend to deviate from guidelines. And sometimes that's very appropriate and sometimes it's not. And so I think there are some some tricks that, that doctors and those who work in hospital can learn from, from what we've done in the pre-hospital environment across the world to try to standardize the way we carry out airway management. And so we have guidelines, and this is our, um, our guideline at Ambulance Victoria. It's freely available online. Our intubation guideline is, is about to be updated in the next six months. Um, uh, it won't change much. Um, but we basically, man we, we create a recipe for our paramedics. They can change it if they like. Um, we encourage our doctors. We, we use doctors for inter-hospital retrieval. We encourage them to follow the same guideline. We also have a difficult airway guideline, which is absolutely non-negotiable. Um, and so we, we, and we assess paramedics on this um, every year. Um, and um, it's, um, we're finding it, you know, as I said, our success rate. We don't have a registry, unfortunately. We have, um, we, um, we don't have a formal registry, I should say. We have an electronic patient record, which gives us some idea of how successful we are. Um, every time one of our paramedics performs a surgical airway, um, I get an email as soon as they do it, as soon as they um, save their electronic PCR, I get notified so I can follow up with them directly. Um, and we haven't had any inappropriate surgical airways, to my knowledge. They've all been absolutely indicated and I would have done the same thing. So I'm very comfortable with where we're at in terms of following guidelines. We use checklists um, and, and the intubation checklist that many of you would use in hospital actually arose from the pre-hospital setting. The London Air Ambulance Service was the first to use a, a pre routinely use a pre-hospital checklist. And, and for those of you who haven't read it yet, I would encourage anyone who works in, in the pre-hospital or critical care space to read Atul, Atul Gawanda's The Checklist Manifesto to give you a, a good um, background on the importance of checklists in high stakes clinical settings. We've already discussed kit dumps. Um, so we um, we use kit dumps. And in fact, at the moment, we're trialing and are probably going to introduce um, this, which is called a scram bag, a structured, um, structured critical airway management bag, um, which is a, a kit dump in a bag. 
Um, we, we've done, we, there's some data published there and we've done our own internal studies showing that this reduces the time taken to intubate significantly and um, um, makes, you know, make, means people aren't missing anything. And there's been some data published on this. This is actually in a pediatric setting, um, looking at how often things were missing or forgotten about um, with a, a, a kit dump versus just a checklist versus just, you know, going, going off your memory. And you, so the, the, um, the blue line there is people just trying to remember what they need. And the green line is the template. Um, and you can see there for everything except the nasogastric tube. And, and all that says to me is they forgot to put a nasogastric tube on the template um, because that's the only one that people still consistently forgot. So I would encourage all of you to look at using kit dumps as well. Um, Pre-drawn syringes. Again, is something that um, may, in our ICU we we do we use pre-drawn syringes for RSI, um, and that's something that's come from the pre-hospital environment. Um, Color-coded pre-pre-drawn syringes to reduce drug errors. Again, something that started pre-hospital. And and just to close, perhaps the biggest thing um, is that we practice and we assess. And I can you know put my hand up and be one hundred percent honest and say never in my medical career. Has anyone ever formally assessed me in a high stakes exam on how to intubate someone? It's never been assessed. It's just, as you all know, it's see one, do one, teach one. Um, in paramedicine and in pre-hospital care, it, even when there's doctors involved in pre-hospital care, in every service I've worked for, you have to be signed off to intubate pre-hospital. You have to undergo an assessment a formalized objective assessment of your ability to safely intubate. And I think that's something that's actually seriously lacking in the in-hospital space that, that we can all learn, both from a learning perspective and also from a patient safety perspective. So that was a bit more rushed than I would have liked because of the technical problems, but just a bit of an overview of um, who we intubate pre-hospital, who should be doing it, how they should be doing it, what you can learn from us, um, and, and a little bit of perhaps a context into how we do things on the other side of the world. Um, happy to answer any questions if we've got time and happy to um, chat via email if anyone has any other questions or wants any of the, the access to any of the resources I've discussed as well. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, David. <clears throat> it was really, really exciting. Could you please uh, stop? Yeah, stop screen sharing. So there is, uh, we are waiting for questions. So any questions are welcome. Uh, also in Hungarian, it's 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 all right because then I translate it. There is one question uh, now in the Q and A. Do you see it, David? Or can you? Uh, I can... So I can read it out. So it the question is really exciting because it it's about. Uh, metabolic acidosis which i mentioned so i emphasize the importance of keeping up respiratory composition for of metabolic acidosis same time there's a strong dogma mm. of avoiding hypocapnia even in mm. acidotic patients in mm. afraid of vestal vasoconstriction so that's yeah. that's about this controversy what 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 are your thoughts i i think that's a great question i think what it comes down to to me is what's going to kill them first and the person asking the question is right we do try to avoid hypocapnia um, but I think there is a trend now, and there's some data to support this, that um, when we, um, what we're, the end tidal CO2 that we're measuring is, is as, I, as I discussed and as other evidence shows, um, it is not what the um, PaCO2 is. And so when you, even when you think you're hyperventilating someone, you're, you, you may not be. Um, and, um, uh, but if someone's severely acidotic, um, those are those, the, the two patients that terrify me around airway management are severe metabolic acidosis and pulmonary hypertension. Um, and sometimes you won't, you mean you often don't know if someone's got pulmonary hypertension or right heart failure. Um, you you may not know if someone's got severe metabolic acidosis, but if you do, the the, the what the, the thing I would do is try not to intubate them at all. And if you had to, you, you have to try and match their minute volume if you can. And so even if they've got a TBI. Uh, it's just bad luck for them, unfortunately. That the uh, you know there, there'll be a you know a small cohort of patients with both of those problems coexisting, um, and yeah, it's I I I would continue to hyperventilate, and I, I routinely now 
ventilate patients through the the apneic period of a, of an RSI. I think there's again there's data to support that. Um, no increased incidence in aspiration and improving uh, improvement in hypoxia and hemodynamics. All right. Uh, if any other questions are absolutely welcome. And just just back to this CO two thing. It's funny because. Uh, it, Normally, in a, in a ventilated patients, we are we are afraid of uh, hypocapnia, like uh, when we reach the uh, thirty three millimeters of mercury, it's considered uh, abnormal. But at the same time, in the DKA patient, they always they quite frequently maintain PCO two values uh, like mm. eight or ten, mm. or at least in children. So it's yeah, really same in adults. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's really a good point to make. Yeah. All right. Any other questions from the audience? But can I can I just ask you, David, uh, one thing? Uh, mm. Because uh, putting in an arterial line pre-hospital is something. Uh, also, the Hungarian, um, actually, the air ambulance is starting starting to do. Um, from the pediatric point of view, I would really be afraid of staying on scene for forty minutes to puncture. <laughs> Two millimeter yeah. artery. Yeah. Uh, how can you limit this time? What do you think? Um, it's a really good question. Um, I don't know enough about the pediatric setting to to answer. I would say I, I, I in, so our flight paramedics um, can do art lines. Our road paramedics can't. Um, that's a situation that I inherited and wasn't too happy about. I, I actually didn't think they should be doing it because I worried about exactly that about prolonged scene times. Um, I strongly encourage our paramedics to only insert art lines in the air so that they're not hanging around on the ground doing it. And then, and then this data has been coming out. It's been a couple of retrospective trials in the last couple of years, the one that I mentioned, plus another one is hinting at a fairly significant survival benefit if you can control um, end titles, uh, sorry, arterial CO2. So I've had to eat some humble pie and say, okay, you can do art lines and maybe we have to start doing them on road as well for people in rural areas. Um, but again, I think we'll have to stipulate that it has to be on route and you can do a bit of choice architecture there. Like um, to give you an example, we've, we've recently introduced tranexamic acid for the management of, of um, major bleeding, um, but we don't want paramedics to hang around on scene giving tranexamic acid. So we only stock it in the ambulance. So I would probably do the same thing. I would only keep the arterial line equipment in the ambulance or in the helicopter. Don't keep it in the bag um, so that it's only something you do on the way to hospital if you've got time. Um, and, and that will eliminate the, the concerns about scene time. But but as you know, there there is some emerging evidence that that, that in, in many patients, that time may actually be beneficial. The problem is you don't know who that one in five, one in 10 patients who has an extra dural is. That's 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 the problem, unfortunately. All right, that's a good point, and and it really leads me leads to the next question I have. Um, actually, the, who those, for those of us who don't know David and his colleague uh, James are doing an excellent podcast called Clinical Conversations, so I recommend it that for all of you. And you also were touching about touching on theme times in the topic of penetrating trauma. Uh, could you please, in a few uh, few words, could you please tell me about that because it's yeah. it's really exciting. We um yeah, so we just we did an episode on on penetrating trauma, which um I would love if you all listen to because we want we want our ratings to go up. Um, I think the something that we realized is that we had been encouraging our paramedics to minimize their scene time in penetrating trauma without saying what that meant, and and so a normal scene time for us is twenty minutes. So they were interpreting that as well as long as it's less than 20 minutes and hanging around and doing stuff on scene. We're now encouraging our paramedics to have, be on scene for as short time as possible, ideally less than five minutes. If the patient's walking, just walk them into the ambulance and get moving, do everything en route. Um, from an airway management point of view, we're encouraging our MICA paramedics that if the patient's unconscious and you're within 10 or 20 minutes of a trauma center, they're not to be intubated, they're to be put on their side um, and just transported under lights and sirens. Um, I think the only role for airway management in the bleeding trauma patient 
is in the setting where um, a, a pre-hospital critical care team that's capable of doing an advanced surgical procedure can locate to you significantly faster than you can locate to a trauma center or in the aeromedical setting where you're an hour away and you, you, know, you have to get the patient packaged up for transport. Um, for all the reasons that you've outlined around, you know, the drugs causing hypotension, a positive pressure ventilation causing hypotension, it's very risky. Um, but I think, yeah, the the, the less is more. And um, in the podcast, we talk about a mnemonic from a, from an English air ambulance service, um, STAB five. So um, I'm not going to remember it now. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's uh, scene safety, um, rapid rapid ten second triage. Um, um, assertive seed management, um, bleeding control, and leaving in less than five minutes if you can. And that's, uh, you know, for an hour setting, penetrating trauma is not that common. Um, I hope it's the same for you. Um, and and it's uh, the problem is it's something the management is very different to everything else because we very much encourage a stay and play mentality in the pre-hospital setting for everything else. So this is the one exception. All right. Yeah, yeah, that's that's really unbelievable, unbelievable for me to to leave this scene in five minutes. But mm. <laughs> probably, really, is that's that is the only possible way to mm. improve your results in this patient group. Mm -hmm. All right, I don't see any other uh, question now in the Q and A or in the chat, so I think we can finish up now. So again, David, thanks really. We are really grateful and we would like to thank you again for joining us and, and giving this exciting talk and also really thankful for the audience for keeping up so so late. So thank you very much. And thank uh, you. Thank you so much. It's been a great, you. great pleasure. I'm really always happy to to share with um friends and colleagues all over the world. All right. Goodbye. Thank you.